Now, Glenn's new book, The Searchers, is his third, and on the surface, it would seem to be somewhat of a departure from his first two books. Uh, those uh, addressed you know, weighty international subjects, the Arab-Israeli conflict in the, in the case of Beyond the Promised Land, and the story of uh, white activists who got immersed in South Africa's anti-apartheid movement in the case of uh, Ravonia's children. But The Searchers, which stems from John Ford's classic Western film of the same name um, starring John Wayne, uh, is much more than about a movie. Uh, it's about the story or stories uh, behind the story, about how fact and myth sometimes blend inseparably into powerful legends with impacts all their own. Uh, it took uh, many of Glenn's formidable journalistic skills to piece together all the historical and literary elements behind the searchers, elements that range over many decades, many miles, and assorted generations. As Glenn mentions in the acknowledgments, he originally had intended the book just to be a, a modest coffee table book uh, for the film's 50th anniversary back in 2006. Now, seven years later, he's produced what a number of critics have hailed as a masterful work of research and storytelling. With meticulous care and eloquent prose, Glenn illuminates what's real, what's imagined, and what has made a lasting difference about uh, not only John Ford's film, but Alan LeMay's popular book on which the film was based, and at the root of it all, Cynthia Ann Parker's A Twisted Life, whose uh, two traumatizing abductions gave rise to the whole story. Already the book, which came out last month, is into its sixth printing with more than 30,000 copies published, and I'm told it'll be number 19 on the New York Times bestseller list. And hopefully, we'll all do our part here today to further boost <laughs> Glenn's sales. Now, Glenn plans to talk for a little while, and then he'll certainly take questions. Uh, if you have a question, we have a microphone there, which we ask you to use if you can get to it, because we do record these events. And now we're videoing uh, some events so that we can uh, post them on our, on our website. And then afterwards, Glenn will be delighted to stay and sign copies of his book, which are for sale at the front of the store. And I think we even have several DVDs of The Searchers uh, on sale as well. Um, anyway, if you haven't already, please silence your cell phones and join me in welcoming Glenn Frankel. Thanks, Brad. First of all, it's great to be at this store in this place. This is my home, home court. And um, I to have my family here and so many good friends and old colleagues, uh, seeing people in the back and all over, it's, it's really quite wonderful. Especially at this particular bookstore, part of what this book is about is about storytellers and about other books that have come and gone over time. So it's appropriate to be here to talk about it. I've got a question. Um, anybody from Texas? OK. Yes, yeah, Steve, <laughs> exactly. And uh, anyone here grow up hearing about Cynthia Ann Parker? <laughs> Thanks, Steve. You're my guinea pig. So, you know, when I'm in Houston, when I was in Houston a few weeks ago or in Austin and asked the same question, everybody's hand went up. Everybody knew about Cynthia Ann Parker. Everybody had studied her in school. Uh, how many people have seen The Searchers? All right. That's, that, that's more what I was expecting, and that's, and that's the case. But that's the case in Texas, too. They know the original story. They know the film. Uh, I, I'm kind of like you. I grew up in Rochester, New York, and I'd never heard of Cynthia Ann Parker, uh, you know, or her son, Quanta Parker. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think I saw the film maybe when I was 12 years old on TV for the first time and saw it a few times after that. And I really had no idea that this incredibly scary and interesting and compelling movie was actually loosely based on a, on a real story. I didn't find that out until seven years ago when, as, as Brad points out, you know, I got to Stanford, started to do research, started looking for an American book, started thinking, what could be more American than The Searchers? I thought maybe, well, captivity narratives, all of that, maybe that would be chapter two, you know, one, one chapter of context. Uh, for a book that otherwise would be your kind of standard making of the movie kind of book. Um, but, uh, you know, it wound up being a whole lot more than that. 
And in fact, the, the real story begins in East Texas, as Steve could probably tell you better than me. It's, it's uh, about 160 miles north of Houston. Um, there's a fortified pioneer settlement there in 1836 called, you know, uh, Fort Parker. It's along the banks of the Navistota River. It's up at the far reaches of the settlement area in Texas at that point. It's really crossed over towards Comanche, towards, towards Native American territory because the soil's good there, the water's good, but it's a bit far removed from the other settlements. And so in May 1836, on a, on a sun, sunny morning, a group of Comanches and Kiowa and other uh, Native Americans show up at this settlement asking for food and water and basically for directions. Uh, and we don't know exactly what happened or why it happened, except that an attack was launched, five men were killed, and five young people were abducted. And they were taken off uh, into Comanche territory. They were split, their abductors split up and split up these five young people. Uh, one of them was a nine-year-old girl named Cynthia Ann Parker, uh, and she went off with a Comanche group. She was raised by her captors. She became the wife of one of the warriors, we believe, who was involved in the raid. Uh, and she eventually becomes the mother of three Comanche children. Meanwhile, her uncle James Parker, one of the survivors of the massacre, searches for her and the other uh, abductees over an eight-year period and eventually helps retrieve or ransom four of them back, but not Cynthia Ann. Uh, she lives with the Comanches for 24 years until she's recaptured in 1860 in another, if you will, murderous raid, only this, the reverse raid, if you will. This time it's carried out by U.S. Cavalry, Texas Rangers. Uh, it's along the banks of the Pease River in North Texas. They kill her friends around her, and they're uh, aiming to kill her when somebody noticed, because she looks like a Comanche, but somebody notices she has blue eyes. And so they take her and her baby daughter, whose name was Prairie Flower, and, uh, and they restore her to her white relatives. And, uh, but she never sees her two Comanche sons again, nor her husband, nor the community she comes from. And she dies in relative misery and obscurity uh, several years later. But her surviving Comanche son, the only one of her three children who, who reached adulthood, uh, is named Quanah Parker. And he becomes an apostle of reconciliation between Comanches and whites. And he invokes the spirit of his dead mother as an explanation for why he's taking this position. Uh, and, the, and, and the two sides of the, Comanche, uh, of the Parker family, one of them Texan, the other side Comanche, still exist. They still hold annual family reunions, separate reunions. Each side holds their own. The, the, the white Parkers are in East Texas. The Comanches get together in Oklahoma. They send emissaries to each other's reunion. They trade a silver bowl, an inscribed silver bowl with each other. I've been to three of those now. I'm looking, I don't see Ron Parker, who's Quanah Parker's great-grandson, uh, was hoping to be here. He lives in Gaithersburg. Maybe he'll show up in a little bit. Anyway, Ron was one of many people in that family who were happy to see me, happy to talk to me, you know, inducted me into all the various things that they do and the relationships they have. But the point is here that just like the families today tell this story and retell it about Cynthia Ann and about Quana, people have been doing that for like 150 years. Um, her story has been retold, altered, embroidered, reimagined by each generation that comes along and does it according to their own needs, if you will, and sensibility. They change the parts they don't like, uh, they alter a few things, they tell it again. Uh, and so, and over time, you know, whatever the truth was and whatever the myth is, is sort of blended together to make one of those great sort of foundational stories about the settling of the American West and about our relationship to Native Americans. There's been like prairie operas on this thing, one act plays, short stories, novels, all of that. And Cynthia Ann's story has basically joined that long list of what we would call captivity narratives. Again, it was something else I didn't know much about when I got started on this, but it turns out that the, the captivity narrative really was our first American literary genre. And uh, the first one dates, and the first bestseller, you know, in the 13 colonies was a book by a woman named Mary Rowlandson in 1682 about her captivity by uh, Narragansett Indians in, in New England, her and her, and her children. Uh, the notion of white women and children being sort of, you know, 
spirited off into the barbarian wilderness by these, you know, by savage Native Americans taken into the darkness. Uh, you know, that really inflamed people's imaginations even back in 1682. Uh, it's got lots of scary connotations. Uh, James Fenimore Cooper's pioneer novels, most especially The Last of the Mohicans, also has a captivity narrative at the heart of it. And, uh, you know, female captives especially were under threat. Um, they were expected somehow by white society to maintain their virginal purity uh, and their religious faith uh, or die trying. And there was a term that was used for being captured by Indians and subjected to, you know, to sex with Indians. It's called a fate worse than death. And so often when these folks were returned to white so-called civilization, they were shunned or they were held somehow suspect. They were polluted. They were impure uh, spiritually as well as physically. Uh, and uh, Cynthia Ann Parker herself had to struggle with this kind of legacy. Um, She'd been dragged across a border, an invisible border, twice in her life, right? When she's nine years old, she's taken off into Comancheria, and she becomes a Comanche bride. And so willingly or unwillingly, she has sex with Indians, and she becomes a Comanche mother. Then she's dragged back again 24 years later. Her Texas relatives, I think, were, 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 were kind people. Um, they didn't condemn her for, for all of this, but they also really couldn't understand her. Um, and Cynthia Ann herself left no narrative, uh, no written account, gave no real interviews about her time as a Comanche. And in a sense, that made it possible for people even to, to create a bigger myth, because they didn't have to worry too much about the facts of, of her life. They just kind of made it up as they went along. And it was my job coming back at this, you know, to try to piece together what was true, or to separate, really, what we could describe as true, what we might know, and what we could only think of as myth. And I did it by trying to find as many first-hand accounts as I could. And it turned out that the University of Texas, for example, uh, in the American History Center, there are scattered first-hand accounts, a couple of handwritten ones that have never been published. They've been referred to here and there, but I, I pulled all of them together as best I could to try to get not the real story, because I don't think there's any way to get the real story, but to get a version of what we can actually establish as maybe true and what we have to just write off as myth. That myth's been very useful to a lot of people over the years. Uh, the Texas Ranger captain who led the raid in 1860 that recovered her was a guy named Sewell Ross. And he went on eventually to run for governor of Texas. And um, part of his campaign you know, biography was the great Indian fighter. And, uh, and he, he claimed in that biography, this is like 24 years later, that he had killed a major warrior, Cynthia Ann's husband, in fact, a, a man named Peta Nakona, that he was killed in 1860 at this raid. Turns out that's not really true. Uh, nonetheless, it helped him get elected in 1886, and he became governor of, of Texas. For a while, when she came back, when she was brought back to the white world, Cynthia Ann was something of a celebrity. Uh, her family took her down to the state legislature, and they got her an annuity and a, and a league of land. Um, she sat in the gallery in Austin while all these white men down below looked up at her, and she thought they were trying her for murder, for being a Comanche. Uh, remember, this is a woman, they had dressed her up, brought her there. This is a woman who for 24 years wore clothes that didn't have buttons. You know, there was no way she could understand what was going on, and she actually tries to flee the gallery when the men look up at her, and they drag her back there. After that, it became clear to her family that she was a bit of an embarrassment. And so, you know, they stop showing her off at some point, and they basically hide her. And they take her off eventually to a family sawmill in Anderson County in East Texas. And curiously enough, for a woman who had a lot of headlines, you know, early on, the white Comanche princess, all of that, for that woman, there's no obituary. We don't know for sure when she died. There's, um, you know, according to the legend, her little daughter, Prairie Flower, probably died in 1864 of typhus or one of those diseases, and Cynthia Ann dies of a broken heart within a few months of that. The only problem with that story is that there's an 1870 census from Anderson County, and her name's on it. So we think she died fairly soon after that, but we don't really know. Um, you know, and, and she's been lauded over time by a lot of people as sort of a you know, each generation, as I say, has kind of described her the way they want her to be. Uh, 
you know, in recent years, we've celebrated her courage and her toughness. She's become a sort of proto-feminist role model. The Texas Monthly, which should know better, uh, wrote about her, quote, the original tough Texas woman, strong as buffalo hide, family-loving and high-spirited, despite dire circumstances. <laughs> but that's another, that's our embroidered myth of who Cynthia Ann was. Um, the truth is, she really wasn't the hardy survivor so much as the ultimate victim of what was a 40-year protracted war, a real clash of civilizations, not like the sort of funny ones that people talk about now between you know, Muslims and Christians, but a real clash of civilizations between two cultures, two nations that, that shared very little except the desire to wipe out each other. Um, Texans and Comanches. And she was, as I say, I, the ultimate victim of that war. Uh, traumatized, raided, saw people around her murdered not once but twice in her life. Uh, uh, there's a schoolgirl in Fort Worth who left an account of seeing Cynthia Ann. Uh, school was let out early one day and they take, the, they take the kids down to a local retail store in Fort Worth. Quote, she stood on a large wooden box surrounded by the curious spectators. She was bound with rope. She wore a torn calico dress. She made a pathetic figure. Tears were streaming down her face. Her cousin, I.D. Parker, did recall that Cynthia Ann, among other things, couldn't adjust to the food. You know, pork and bread and potatoes didn't work. But one day they slaughtered a cow. I.D. slaughtered a cow. And Cynthia Ann and prairie flour were all over it uh, before it had even stopped twitching. As soon as the beef was open, she took out the kidneys and liver, and they commenced eating and dancing and yelling in real savage style, the blood running down their faces and the smoke from the warm liver rising as they ate. It's not exactly the Mediterranean diet. <laughs> she never saw those Comanche sons again, even though where she lived was only perhaps 100 miles away. But that was a border you couldn't cross. First of all, the Civil War started. Second of all, they were in the midst of what was a 40-year war. At one point, the family brings a translator uh, who knows Comanche, a scout, to come and talk to her. And she embraces him. And once she finds out he knows Comanche, because she really doesn't speak any English, you know, she's begging him and pleading with him to take her back to her family, to her Comanche family. But he won't do it. And she says, but if you take me, they'll reward you. They'll give you horses. They'll give you women. They won't hurt you. And he says, well, I don't know that. If I take you there, they may kill me. But I know for sure that if I take you there and they don't kill me, when I come back, these people will kill me. So there was no way to go. And he never comes back. He never visits her again. She's left on her own. And as I say, she dies probably a little after 1870. But if there's one saving grace in this really, really sad story, um, it's something that she herself never, never knew about, which is to say that her surviving son, Quanah Parker, uh, took her last name after he surrendered in 1875 at the tail end of this 40-year struggle. And he becomes a rather heroic figure. He becomes the middleman, if you will, uh, between Coman the Comanche Nation, which is really down to less than 3,000 people at the time of the surrender, uh, and the American government, which is basically in charge of them. In some ways, being a ward of the American state, you know, as a Native American, was a much more treacherous uh, position to be in than being a nomadic warrior at war with the U.S. government. Because in many ways, it was your friends or the people who thought they were your friends who were your worst enemies, who were the people who were trying to destroy your culture. For so many progressives of that era, they felt the only way that, that Native Americans could survive is if they stopped speaking their native language, cut off their braids, started wearing you know, white clothes, started going to you know, Indian schools where they could only speak English. In other words, they needed to have their culture obliterated. They needed to be turned into little white people. And so Quanah Parker becomes the navigator, if you will, protecting his identity and, and, you know, and, and the parts of the heritage that he believes in he has seven wives, for one thing, and he's constantly being told, you know, you got to get it down to one wife somehow, Quanah. <laughs> and he says something like, well, I'm willing to do that, but you'll have to tell the other six. <laughs> anyway, he manages to keep them going, and he lives till 1911, and he's retelling her story again from his perspective to explain who he is and why he takes the positions he takes. This is a myth that's constantly, you know, reinventing itself. And so after his death, it kind of lies fallow for a while. But then we get to the centennial, 1836, of both Texas independence, the year of the Alamo, all of that, and also the, uh, the centennial of the raid on Parker's Fort. And what happens is they rebuild the fort 
in East Texas, and they hold a reenactment of the raid, and they have members of, of the Parker Comanche family come down from Oklahoma to play the Indian Raiders, and they have the whites play the white, you know, and there we are, and they sell boxes of Cynthia Ann Parker ice cream. <laughs> so, you know, it's, we're not the first ones to have invented the commercialization of our heritage. In, in the early 1950s, it gets revived again, if you will. There's a, a Hollywood screenwriter and Western novelist named Alan LeMay. And Alan has been kicking around Hollywood for a number of years. Some years he makes a lot of money, other years he doesn't make anything. And uh, he's in, he, he figures out at one point that if you're going to make money in Hollywood, you've either got to produce movies or direct movies. And he's directing a B picture up in the Texas panhandle and comes across this story, this kind of legendary account, because the Panhandle and Palo Duro Canyon really is the stronghold, you know, of the Comanche Nation during the warfare. Uh, you know, he's desperate for a good story, so he makes his way to East Texas, and he interviews some of the Parker family members. They're curious in that he's not really focusing on Cynthia Ann, on, on, the, on the little girl. He's more interested in the uh, avenging uncle who's looking for her for eight years, Uncle James, and he asks a lot of questions. And Alan eventually comes up and writes a novel called, well, first it's a four-part serial in Saturday Evening Post called The Avenging Texans, and it becomes The Searchers. Uh, and he turns the focus from uh, the female captive to two relatives, an uncle uh, and then a totally fictional adopted brother uh, who searched for her over a five-year period. Uh, Published in 1954, gets a really good review in the New York Times and elsewhere. It's, a, it's actually a very good, though relentlessly grim, uh, novel. And then John Ford comes along, the sort of famed Hollywood director. Uh, he's looking for a new project. John Ford didn't invent the Western, but he really is the sort of father of the modern Western and the man most closely identified with it. In 1950, at a point where he had already won four Academy Awards for Best Director, he stands up in a group of directors at, at a public meeting. He says, my name is John Ford, and I make Westerns, as if they didn't know. Um, he made a lot of other great films. Those four Oscars, which incidentally are still the most anyone's won, any director's won for best director, none of them are for Westerns. They're all for other movies. The Western, you know, it's kind of considered a little bit, um, what, you know, too popular, a little too cowboys and Indians, you know. so. You know, for Ford, he doesn't, get, he doesn't get the glory, the artistic glory for those movies, though when we look back at them now, we see them very differently. The Western, though, was at the heart of his identity, and he thought The Searchers was a terrific idea for a film. And he enlists his old drinking buddy and, uh, you know, protege, that's a guy named John Wayne, and, uh, and he gets financing for this outside the studio system from uh, a, a very wealthy man named Cornelius Vanderbilt Whitney. That's Vanderbilt and Whitney, right? <laughs> so uh, Sonny Whitney, one of the richest men in the world, who's looking to get into Hollywood for a variety of reasons. They sell the distribution rights to Warner Brothers. And then Ford takes his company, his crew, the people he always took with him, Wranglers and stuntmen and, and, you know, and supporting actors and all these folks and family members. And he takes them to his favorite location. And he takes John Wayne, too. And they go off to Monument Valley. And this is like, I think, the fifth movie he's made there, maybe the sixth. And the result is a movie that even now, so many years later, uh, recently finished number seven on the sight and sound list, not of best westerns, but of best movies, period. It's number seven. You know, take that for what you will but it's considered a classic film. It's a movie that John Wayne thought was so good. He named his, his, his son, who was born later, Ethan, after the part he played in the movie. Uh, so how many folks have been to Monument Valley? Oh, that's pretty good. How many have been to Texas? So in your experience, does Monument Valley? No. <laughs> Not really, right? Monument Valley is vertical, right? It's mesas, it's all this really grand, you know, dramatic altitude. And it comes across pretty well on a movie screen. Texas, kind of mostly just kind of flat and horizontal, right? It is, uh, the only thing dramatic about most of Texas is its relentless lack of drama. You know, it just lays out in front of you. But, you know, I, I think Monument Valley looks a bit like all of us ignorant, you know, northerners think Texas should look, right, right? 
It's dramatic. It's scary. It's big and strong, you know, and it's awfully dry. No one actually could ever live there. I think maybe 100 Navajo are scattered around in this 40 square mile area uh, because it's, it's, it's incredibly dry. There's almost no water. It's freezing in the winter. It's, it's 120 degrees in the summer. It's a relentlessly uninhabitable place. John Ford sets up his villages. He sets up his forts. He sets up his settlers. They all live in Monument Valley. And even when he begins the movie, he has the first panel says, Texas, 1868, and the woman opens the door, and there we see Monument Valley in front of us. He's saying it's a fable, right? It's as much of a, it, this is his theater. This is where he does his work. It's like saying the, at the Globe Theater, we're now in Italy to, you know, hear a tale about star-crossed young lovers, or, or we're in Denmark, right, with a Danish prince. We're in a land of myth. And so, and John Ford is really in many ways our ultimate cinematic myth maker. And he makes a movie that's about race and it's about gender and it's about warfare and it's about revenge. And it's a movie beloved not only by me and some people in this room, but also by Steven Spielberg and George Lucas, uh, you know, and Martin Scorsese, all of them, all of whom saw it when they were young, when they were thinking about becoming filmmakers, all of them quote it in their writing, in their own movies. And there are some of the people who have really made the searchers, you know, the sort of enduring classic that we think of it now. Ford and his in-house scriptwriter, a guy named Frank Nugent, uh, who at one point was the New York Times film reviewer, and a pretty good one, uh, goes out, another classic guy, Daryl Zanuck, brings him out to Hollywood, gives him some scripts to do. He bombs, doesn't work, uh, ends up writing for Ford. Anyway, uh, Ford and Nugent take the story from the novel. And, the, you know, in the novel, there's two searchers, and they're both a sort of of equal stature. In fact, the younger one, the one named Martin Pauly, becomes really the centerpiece of the novel. But in the film, they've got John Wayne. And so the older searcher, the uncle, they call him Ethan Edwards, they beef up his role, and they darken his role quite a bit. They take all those sort of scary little psychosexual questions, you know, from the original, you know, fate worse than death, what happens to our women. They raise those right up to the surface. That's what The Searchers is all about. Uh, because in the movie, the uncle, the man who's searching for this little girl, is searching for her at the beginning to retrieve her. She's nine. But as time goes on and the search continues, she grows into a young woman. She becomes a Comanche wife. And his search changes, his mission changes, his quest is no longer to restore her to the family. He's planning to kill her, and the reason he's planning to kill her is because she's had sex with Indians, voluntarily or not. It's an honor killing, in other words. Um, the uncle is bent on enforcing you know, sexual and racial purity. That's what the search is about for him. Wayne gives a towering performance. You know, I used to say, yeah, I really love The Searchers, even though it's a John Wayne movie. You know, I've changed my mind about that. Um, I think our image of John Wayne is that kind of, you know, overweight, toupee-wearing, you know, guy, you know, uh, pro-Vietnam War uh, advocate of the 60s and early 70s, who's basically making the same movie over and over again, mostly with second-rate directors. He's playing John Wayne, right? And, and uh, you know, for a lot of reasons, he doesn't get much credit there. But there's another John Wayne. You know, uh, the one who worked with John Ford, the one who worked with Howard Hawks, who really were two of Hollywood's finest directors. Um, and working for them, he creates, I think, a range of characters in a number of movies uh, that are really distinctly American characters. And really, he, he, he creates a unique film persona, a charisma, a bit of menace, some charm, right? You know, Wayne himself, I came to decide, is himself a storyteller and a myth maker. He didn't invent these roles, but he invented the character who played them, a character named John Wayne. And uh, you know, that sort of slow pigeon-toed walk, uh, the emphatic clipped speaking voice, you know, all of that, the glare. These are actors' traits. These aren't the real, you know, mer you know uh, John Wayne. These are the, these, this is the role he plays, and he's really quite brilliant in producing. If you can think of, you know, are there a lot of actors, movie actors from that era who came up with personas, and who came up with a persona that stretches back in its tradition all the way back to James Fenimore Cooper, all the way back to the backwoodsman. 
He's the man who knows Indians. He's the Indian fighter. He's the lone laconic gunman. All these things that Wayne comes to embody. In The Searchers, Ethan Edwards possesses all of these qualities, right? All of these traits. He's got a very, you know, manly virtues and dark charisma. But he's also tainted by racism and, and he's crazed by revenge. Remember, this dark knight isn't going out to rescue this little girl. He's going out to kill her. And uh, Wayne had played morally ambiguous men before in Red River uh, in, in the late 40s for Howard Hawks, uh, the great uh, cattle drive movie. He plays a very dark figure, if you will. But I think in The Searchers, he's darker and angrier and more troubled than ever. Still, because he's John Wayne, we identify with him. I mean, he's a very charismatic actor, um, even as we recoil from what it is he's going to do. And that's one of the things that makes The, Sel the Searchers such an unsettling movie, because we don't know what he's going to do. And for those of you who haven't seen it, I'm not going to tell you what he does. <laughs> I spent a lot of time in the archives in Hollywood. You know, in some ways it was easier to research Texas in the 19th century than it is to research John Ford, because John Ford doesn't write anything down. Uh, he just does it. And you have to figure out why he did it. He hated to be interviewed. Uh, you know, he, he, he was nasty to interviewers. When I was thinking of who would I really like to talk to if I could bring them back, I'd love to talk to John Wayne. He was such a generous, you know, uh, humorous person to talk to. Ford, not so sure, not so sure. He doesn't explain why he does the thing. So we have to look at like the final shooting script that Nugent put together and then look at what's actually in the movie. And, um, you know, Nugent's script, I think, is justifiably considered one of the great Hollywood scripts. But when you read it and then you watch the film, you see all the things Ford does differently. And mostly what he does, inevitably, is he, he scratches out dialogue. He takes away exposition. He doesn't explain things. He leaves it to us to decide why certain things happen. It's very ambiguous at times. Um, and I think this is really, in some ways, the most important key to why the movie's a great movie that sort of consistent discipline and Ford's visual narrative storytelling. It does make the searchers more ambiguous, it makes it more lyrical, and that's why I think it, it's honored today. Maybe so. Let me say one other thing about this ambiguity. How many of you have seen Zero Dark Thirty? So, you know, I know I've got searchers on the brain and, you know, it's a incurable disease, but I'm looking at Maya, the hero heroine of Zero Dark Thirty, and I'm seeing Ethan Edwards. There are two people on a mission, right? Um, they don't really care who they anger. She's on a solitary, single-minded mission. It's about justice, but it's about revenge also, right? She does whatever she has to do. She rounds up a posse. She angers her co-workers. She does things that cross the line in many ways. Uh, and after the deed is done, and I guess I'll tell you, they do kill Bin Laden at the end of the movie. Uh, she doesn't get to go back, really. The last scene is her alone in this large cargo plane, right? And they ask her, where do you want to go? And that's the end of the movie. She has no answer. She's isolated from the very society she has protected. Well, very similar to, to, to Ethan Edwards and what happens to him. But there's one difference. She's just a hero. I mean, we may, you know, not be too happy about the waterboarding. We may not like her choice in, you know, dietary, um, you know, crackers and stuff as she's doing it. But she's a, she's, a, she's a hero. I mean, I don't think there's any two ways about how we're supposed to feel about Maya. We're not supposed to feel that way about Ethan Edwards and John Wayne. We're supposed to have a lot of moral qualms about what he does and how he does it and how it all turns out. It's not simple. Ford is under, is giving us that, you know, that, solitary figure who we honor in westerns and in movies. He's giving us Maya, but he's also undermining this character at the same time. And that's, to me, what makes Searchers such a special, part of what makes it so special as well. It was largely overlooked in its time. Um, came out in 56, got, got good reviews, and did pretty well in the box office. No Academy Award nominations, and it was hailed as just a pretty good cowboy and Indian movie starring John Wayne. Uh, nobody noticed all this stuff going on in it. It's only in later generations, as I say, that it's been recognized as one of the great Hollywood movies. Um, and it's really the forerunner of a lot of sort of postmodern, you know, westerns, from Ford's The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance, uh, which is a great movie, to The Wild Bunch, to Clint Eastwood's Unforgiven. I think when you look at those movies, they all flow one way or the other from Searchers. Uh, one critic once wrote that just as 
Ernest Hemingway once said, all of American modern American literature flows from Huckleberry Finn. Uh, Stuart Byron once said, in the same broad sense, it could be said that all recent American cinema derives from John Ford's Searchers. So my, my book is about a lot of things in the end. It's about people searching, Cynthia Ann and Quanah, uh, sort of searching for a safe haven, for some way to live in the world, to survive. It's about storytellers, because like Uncle James Parker, who left his own narrative, troubled narrative of his unsuccessful search, Alan LeMay, who writes the novel, Ford and Wayne, for that matter, who tell stories in order to explain the world to themselves and to explain themselves to the world. It's also about mothers who lose their children and who can never find them again. Um, and it's about all our Western myths, you know, the bloodthirsty, rapacious, you know, barbaric uh, Native Americans, the Indian hater, the Indian killer, the noble savage, which is what Quanah really, the role that he ends up playing. Um, and it's about a movie, uh, about a legend, if you will, that itself has become a legend, I think. As I say, I'm not going to tell you how it ends. I just want to paraphrase uh, the film critic David Thompson, who says that he finds The Searcher so unsettling that each time he watches it, he's not sure how it's going to end. So I'm going to leave it there. I'd love to answer some questions. And the microphone is over here. I'm afraid we have to use, we should head to the mic, right? Just this one over here? So why don't we head that way? Uh, well, thank you for a wonderful uh, presentation of a very dark subject when done in a very humorous manner. Uh, I had the occasion to read the book before I saw the movie. And I just wondered, uh, when I read the book, to me, and then compared it to the movie, you know, movies have to short, you know, shortcut. And in the book, the search is chronicled in detail, all the various Sub subunits of the Comanches that he goes to. It's like an ethnography uh, treatise. It's really quite interesting. Do you like Alan LeMay's book? Oh, I love Alan LeMay's book. Alan um, knew a lot about Native Americans. He knew a lot about the West. He knew a lot about firearms, a lot about horses. He'd grown up in Indiana, but half his family originally was from Kansas. In fact, they settled in Kansas in the 1870s when the, uh, the Indian Wars were still going on. And the Cheyenne Autumn uh, episode where Cheyenne are in western Kansas trying to get back to their native lands in Colorado. They passed through there and some of his relatives were quite close to there. Alan always talks, you know, he's one of those hard-bitten Hollywood guys, you know, he's just out to make a buck, you know, he's just, he's writing western novels because everybody knows western novels sell in the 1930s and 40s and he's making screenplays just for that. But you know, he sells him, himself short. I mean, I think this really was he, what he cared about. And, uh, and he turns to the searchers when he needs something special, when he wants to get back to something that he really knows and cares about. Um, and he himself was a screenwriter, of course, so there's a lot of good, you know, I'm sure you notice some of the dialogue you see in the novel appears right in the film. You know, some of the best lines come directly from the novel by way of Frank Nugent, who knows a good line of dialogue when he sees it too. So, you know, it's very hard. One of the things Nugent has to figure out is how to telescope in the book. It's a five-year search. How to do that in a movie. So at one point, he has Martin, one of the two searchers, write a letter to his, uh, to his uh, love of his life back home. And in the letter, he describes all these things that go on. And that becomes the narrative device to, like, have two years pass, right? Because Martin doesn't write many letters. Uh, and, you know, and they, and they dip from Martin's narrative into a couple of incidents. That's the way... So they had to figure out how to make that work. But no, I think the, diff the other main difference, I would say, is the novel is relentlessly grim. The Searchers, the, the film has humor. It has a sense of community. It has some of John Ford's sort of cornball Irish humor, which some people love, and others, including members of my family, <laughs> find a little silly at times. Uh, speak up if I'm talking about you, Betsy Ellen. <laughs> you know, that's the way they leaven it. Um, to try, it's a relentlessly grim novel, but I think it's brilliantly done. Anybody else want to traipse over to the microphone? Yes. So, sorry if you spoke to this earlier, but I'm curious about the whole Confederate aspect of the movie. Um, the fact that Ethan's supposed to be a Confederate veteran, you know, which probably influences his racism, and just the whole, you know, how that might affect both like the different ways we look at the movie now, watching it in 2013, versus how they might have looked at it in 1956 when it came out, and whether 
you know, does that make it a broader kind of American studies -y? Oh, it's not just Ethan being personally racist or Texas in that time being racist, but what at the time the movie came out, what how would people have interpreted that about, you know, the continuing myth of the lost South or the old South and, you know, race relations in that regard? That That's a really good question. Um, I shied away a little from the analyses that say, well, this movie was shot in 1955 after Brown versus the Board of Education. Clearly, it's a parable about, you know, race relations. I, you know, I didn't want to go there. The Confederate, moving the story, Alan LeMay moved the story up to 1868. He did so in part, not so much because of the Civil War, but because that was the twilight of the Comanche-Texan Wars. Uh, the Comanches lose over that six, seven year period, but they're still fighting hard. And so the searchers, they're moving into this borderland area. In the movie, they make more of it, I would say. Everybody served in the Confederacy. But in the movie, uh, the uncle, rather than living on the ranch on and off throughout the years after the Civil War, has disappeared. When the Civil War ends in 1865, he's nowhere to be found. And for three years, and then he shows up three years later, rather mysteriously. And that's the beginning of the movie, is this new force coming into the picture. This man, we don't know what he's been doing. Uh, uh, he, and he doesn't say what he does. We know he has a, a, a couple of bags full of, you know, of, of newly minted you know, dollars. Uh, we don't know where he got them. We're led to believe he's been walking you know, other sides of the law, that as a Confederate, as a renegade Confederate, he meets up with his old partner, another, you know, uh, Reverend Clayton, who also served with him. And Clayton says, you know, I didn't, see, you know, you weren't at the surrender. I didn't, come to think of it, you know, you, you weren't there. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and Ethan says, don't believe in surrenders. Didn't beat my sword into no plowshare either. So he's been doing something with that sword. And it all adds to the mystery. The racism... I would argue there's another moment that is more clear about the meaning of the racism, and that's toward the end of the movie, and this is in the novel as well, when Laurie, the young woman who was originally betrothed to Martin and who's about to marry someone else because she's tired of waiting for seven years to get her, you know, her fiancé back, she speaks the most racist lines of all. She's wearing her white dress. The wedding's been aborted. She's sitting there. Martin's going to go off looking for his adopted sister again, and she says, you can't go this time. Ethan's going to kill her, and that's exactly what Martha, the, the, her mother, would want because she's become a Comanche squaw. She's married Comanche. She's been sold to the nearest, you know, and, and it's a really nasty, evil thing she says. And I think they put that, that LeMay and, and Nugent put that in her mouth. because we, we like Lori. She, Lori's a really nice person, I mean, by and large. But she's speaking the same kind of racist stuff that Ethan believes in. And we get the sense then that this is a community norm. This isn't just Ethan on some sort of, you know, vengeance thing that nobody would support. This is actually what, you know, what, um, what this is the community speaking out. There is a real struggle going on in the searchers between the sort of vengeful, macho, let's go kill our enemies, you know, women and children aside, you know, let's go, let's go murder these people and get our blood back versus I, what I would argue is the feminine view of, of Mrs. Jorgensen, Laurie on Better Days, um, Martha, the mother, who, uh, you know, they, who want to restore their family. Who, who don't, it's not about vengeance. And there's one point where Mrs. Jorgensen says to Ethan, Ethan, you know, don't let the boys throw their lives away if the girls are dead. You know, promise me you'll, you know, you'll protect lives. You know? and, and he doesn't even answer. He just rides off because that's not his intention at all. He could care less who he kills or who gets killed. He's got a mission, and that mission is a bloody, hard-minded because that's where they live and that's who he is. So, yes, there's a lot of racism, and I think you can read a lot of things into it, but I think there's enough there on the surface to give you plenty. Yes? You know, all this talk about John Wayne, I can't get out of my mind the image of him riding a tank in Harvard Square in the 70s. <laughs> yeah. He did this self-parody for Harvard Lampoon. But to what degree do you think, is there evidence that he went to the grave a true believer, um, or what? Well, you know, Wayne was an entertainer. And he was smart enough to know uh, that he had a big constituency out there. And, and so he was happy to show up at the Lampoon thing and ride a tank and be the parody of the Green Beret guy. But he was also, he was a true believer. Um, 
I'm trying to think of some examples of that. You know, he was involved in, in red baiting and in the blacklisting. He and his pal Ward Bond, who is in the searchers as well and is terrific in the searchers. They were two of the leaders. Uh, Gary Wills, in his book about Wayne from many years ago, claims that, that Wayne wasn't a leader so much as he followed, you know, followed along. That in the wonderful phrase, he says, Wayne came along afterwards and shot the wounded. <laughs> you know, which I think is a little harsh, but nonetheless. Wayne was a real patriot. There's a, there's a horrifying interview in Playboy around this time where he's talking about Native Americans, and he's actually saying that we glorified them too much in my movie. Uh, they had this land, and they had, we had all this land, and they wouldn't share it. So naturally, we took it away from them. What's wrong with that? Uh, he also said a lot of things about African Americans and uh, the Civil Rights Movement in that interview that all, you know, uh, that, well, it, it doesn't age well. It doesn't age well. But the question is, you know, who owns Wayne? So is he going to be owned by that faction of, uh, you know, of our culture? Well, what about the other Wayne? What about the one who plays Ethan Edwards and, you know, and plays these other roles and gives us a much more vulnerable, interesting uh, figure who's you know, much more complex and ambiguous figure? I think we get a chance to own that one, too. Alan LeMay's got another novel called The Unforgiven, in which Audrey Hepburn yes. takes the part of the adopted child, and as I recall, intercedes with the Weiss to defend them at the end of that. Is there anything in LeMay's background that this he actually has a familial connection with this not, episode? Not that I'm aware of, okay. of, of, a, you know, of a captivity where someone's abducted, no. But you're right, The Unforgiven is his other, it's, it follows The Searchers, it's his next novel, and it takes, the, you know, it takes the focus and moves it to, it's a white family that finds a Kiowa baby and raises that baby into a full-grown girl, and hey, her family shows up one day and wants her back. Only they're Kiowa warriors, and you know things don't go so well. And incidentally, I don't know. Maybe do you love that movie? It's it's pretty. It's awfully difficult to picture Audrey Hepburn as the captive Indian. <laughs> it's a John Huston movie, and it to me it shows that even Isn't with it John a good uh, John Huston is the director. Okay. No, it's Huston, and even though he's a great director. I think it's a really poorly done Western, and it shows that even great directors, you know, that Westerns aren't easy to make, uh, that some people know, have the knack John Ford did, and some people, you know, and you're right, Audrey Hepburn, Burt Lancaster's in it with kind of a, you know, Brooklyn accent, uh, all that. There's some problems, but, but it's fascinating that LeMay stays on the subject. Right. It's the same basic subject from a different point of view. His first book, way back in the 20s, um, is about Cheyenne Autumn, and it painted, it's called Painted Ponies. And it has a, it also, its main character is someone who knows the Cheyenne language and who is sort of, again, one of the, the man who knows Indians. That's one of the tropes in, in American literature and in our mythology of the West. Goes back to Daniel Boone, you know, to Hawkeye and James Fenimore Cooper, this man who's grown up with Indians, knows their lore. Sometimes he's an Indian fighter, sometimes he's an Indian protector. This is an archetypal figure that we have. And so his very first book is very sympathetic to the Cheyenne and, and really a great book in many ways. Searchers is not sympathetic. Searchers, and, and asked about that, Alan basically said, look, well, I thought I told their side, now I wanted to tell my family's side, which is to say the side of the settlers. But I don't know of any specific captivity moment in his family's history. And another great uh, John Wayne, John Ford collaboration, not a Western, uh, uh, Eugene O'Neill's The Long Voyage Home. Yeah, yeah, he's fabulous in that. You want to see John Wayne act? He's a Swedish sailor in that movie. Hi. Um, okay, so you've written a book about a great American story. It's going to be number 19. You've got your family here. My question is, what's next? <laughs> do, you, do you have your next project? We can't let you rest on your laurels. The book's too good, okay? So what's up next? Well, I really appreciate your saying that. I don't think it can make this into a formula, you know? Uh, the no, search I wondered, is I, seriously, I, I'm always fascinated. You know, there's a period of time, okay, you come from a reporting background. Research, and I don't. If, you know, if it's secret, I don't mean for you nah. to reveal it, obviously. But it's always interests me. You know, there's a process, and you've got this time and enjoy it and relax. But you're a writer, so in the back of your mind, somewhere, there's a seed, there's a germ, there's something. Well, my agent's in the back, so she's she's going to tell me. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you the one book I really want wanted to do and may right. come back to and failed at, and that was I wanted to do a biography of Brian Epstein. Oh, that uh, would be interesting. Manager of the Beatles. Yeah, that would And be I went to Liverpool, again, took some family members, uh, dragged them along as usual. 
And I love, uh, Brian is a fascinating character. Yeah. He's, he's, he's yeah. gay. He's Jewish. Yeah. He's the person who gets the Beatles out of Liverpool. Without Brian, I don't think they ever get out of there. There are no archives. <laughs> There's you know, very few people to talk you can to. make it up. <laughs> well, I've thought about that. <laughs> Maybe a play at some yeah, point you where go. you can take, you know, right. bridge the gap Very between the facts and have Brian tell his own story. Um, he's a great, great story. He's dead by 32. Um, and we think of him as an older guy, right? You know, he's the old guy who's taking care of the Beatles. He was like five years older than they were. Mm -hmm. He really loved them. I mean, he loved them in every possible way, spiritually, physically. He just had a thing for them. And he, he's the one who created them. So, you know, I don't know that I can do that because, as I say, there are no archives. It's very hard to get the factual data. And I'm basically, hope you've noticed, a nonfiction writer. <laughs> <Yeah>. uh, <laughs> but, you know, I'll throw that one out as one I still long for. Anybody else? Woman so, in the back. Come around the back. <laughs> so how have the descendants... Uh, reacted to having you peel back the layers of the legend? Uh, for the most part, the ones I've talked to have been very good about it. Um, they, you know, uh, I think they think of Quanah Parker especially as an overlooked figure. You know, he's not Geronimo, he's not uh, Sitting Bull. He didn't go down in a hail of bullets. He didn't become a buffoon. He kept his dignity, he worked hard, and um, he was a very well-known figure in the 1890s, he's one in the early 20th century. He he's involved in Teddy Roosevelt's inaugural parade. There are like six, you know, Native American chiefs who Roosevelt invites up. He tells them what to wear, incidentally, and everything. And uh, and Quan is one of them. So at the time, he's fairly well known, but he drifted into obscurity. A lot of people. I mean, people hear hear of Quanah Parker. Yeah, a few. Yeah, yeah. And you know, Sam Gwynn's book a few years ago uses Quanah, so he's making a bit of a comeback. Uh, so I think they were, you know, I spent a lot of time with folks. I don't know what all of them have, have thought about it, but generally my reception in places where I was frankly worrying, you know, you mentioned all our time at the Washington Post. I mean, basically, even in Texas, I'm basically just a foreign correspondent, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean that in a good way. <laughs> and, but I mean, I'm coming in to this, parachuting into this story, into this, you know, Two two hundred year history, and I'm just kind of waltzing around and you know making judgments and doing research and saying, well, that's true. That no, no, forget that. You're wrong there. You know, it's a very perilous thing to do. It's not as bad as the Arab-Israeli conflict, I should add, <laughs> but it's but it's getting up there. And so I'm always worried about pe how people are going to react. And so far, I, I have to say, I mean, you'll back me here, right, Betsy? And crowds have been very warm and friendly and sympathetic. Nobody's really called me out. I know there are a couple of mistakes in the book because I've heard from a few people about them, and I need to correct them. I will not be talking about those today. <laughs> um, but nobody's, you know, nobody's really come after me yet. I'm kind of waiting for it because I think there, you know, I think there are justifiable things you can say, and there are other ways to look at Native Americans and to look at Quanah's life. And so we'll see. Anyone else? Yes. One more question. Oh, <laughs> oh I'm sorry. You first. Yeah. Can you just talk about how you reported out her life between 19, 9 and 33? Were there any written documents, or is it just family history that also is its own lore? It's very much its own lore, um, because, as I say, she left nothing. There's a Comanche oral tradition that's just as interesting and just as unreliable as the, you know, as the Texan one, I would say. Um, it had to do, there are a couple of other kids who were kidnapped, who were abducted, including a 10-year-old named Dot Bab. Several years later, and she only stayed with the Comanches for a year, but I tell her story briefly in the book because that seems like the most, the closest. Comanches abducted people for all kinds of reasons. They really had quite an industry of abduction for a while. They had a low birth rate. They needed to replenish both with children and with labor. Uh, they were terrific horsemen. And they were great buffalo hunters, and that's a labor-intensive activity. And so as the horse, you know, as their culture became a horse culture, they needed a, a larger population of slaves and workers to sort of maintain it. So they would kidnap people in part, you know, they would kidnap people of, of many ages. Uh, 
And then they would sort of sort through. If you were over 15, say, yeah, you were basically slated to be a slave or a servant. You could work your way into the Comanche community, but it was really hard because you were there for your labor. If you were a baby, you were in serious trouble when those warriors kidnapped you because they were traveling over hundreds of miles and they weren't interested in babies. And bad things happened to babies in that situation. But if you hit that magic age where you're between, say, eight years old and 15, you were good to go. If you were a male, it was like going to summer camp, you know, uh, endless summer camp. They would train you to be a warrior. They'd train you how to hunt, uh, you know, how to fight, all of that. If you were a woman, there was a lot more work to be done. But at the same time, still, you were often embraced in a family. Often families had lost babies, you know. It's pretty tough out there on the limestone plains uh, when you're a nomadic warrior tribe. So, you know, you were treated, Dot Bab was embraced. She was taken to a woman who had lost her only child and, and who was a widow. And she and this woman literally embraced her and taught her how to do all this stuff and treated her as her own. And when they come looking for Dot Bab a year later, when, a, when a scouts come in there searching for this little white girl, the, the mother tries to hide her and finds to her great dismay that Dot wants to go back that she's been 10, she still remembers her white family and she still can speak English and she wants to go home and she does go home. Cynthia Ann, that didn't happen. She stayed with the Comanches, she never got recovered, no one saw her for many years. The few sightings that occurred, maybe some are real, maybe some are not, happened later. So by then, so we can only extrapolate a little bit, but it, in, in a sense it's more fertile ground for myth making because nobody knows for sure who she grew up with. Nobody knows for sure if she was Petta Nakona's only wife and it was a love match or whether he had like four or five wives and she was the chore wife, you know. Um, call it any way you want it or whether she was his wife at all. I mean, all these things are up for grabs in many ways. We think we know them. Texas history books tell us precisely what happened, but we don't know. Yes, this is the last one. I'm, I came late and I apologize. I don't know if you were just I just came from Portland, Maine, where John, John mm. Ford was born and raised. I'm going there. We're going there uh, next February. <clears throat> Did you address in your book the, the whole phenomenon of the fact that you, sp you speak of myth, that John Wayne essentially took the persona of John Ford and made it into his movie star image? I mean, he, wa he made a point of walking like Ford, talking like Ford, and Ford was this ugly guy. and. Wayne was this quite handsome man, and he took this persona, and he became John Wayne. And uh, I just wonder, if did, is that part of what you talk about? In, in your yeah, but I'm going to dispute some of that. I think he oh, did take a persona from several different people. He certainly took his, some of his attitude and his commanding, uh, you know, sensibility from Ford. He admired Ford greatly. He loved the way Ford could run a film set that commanding image. Ford really became a sort of, you know, uh, tough father for him. His yeah. own father was a little less so. So psychologically, I think he, you're absolutely right. He's adapting uh, a lot from John Ford, not as abusive as Ford, but nonetheless tough, you know, demanding, disciplined. John Wayne was a very disciplined actor. He worked all the time. He got all that from John Ford. The walk, the talk, I mean, there's Harry Carey Sr., uh, who he's following around. There's Yakima Canute, the famed uh, stuntman. Uh, Yakima Canute wasn't much of an actor, but Wayne watched him when he wasn't acting, when he was actually interacting with other stuntmen, when he got into trouble. When Canute got, into, uh, got angry, he'd smile. Wayne noticed that. And his voice slowed down, and the sentences got slower when he got angry, you know? And Wayne's watching all that. Wayne is imitating that. Paul Fix, who later became, he was on The Rifleman, a few things. He was a uh, you know, B-movie actor. Uh, you know, uh, Paul Fix coached Wayne in the, in the pigeon-toed walk. This is, but you're right, this is all an invention. Wayne, and Wayne's craft is he's borrowing from this person and that person. Ford admired Wayne immensely in some ways, even when he treated him abusively. Wayne, the Wayne persona became a guy that Ford wanted to be in some ways. And it's only Ford wasn't that bad looking. Well, <laughs> I'm talking about the, the senior Ford. As he got older, yes. Yeah. But he was, a, he was a fairly handsome man when he was a young man. He's actually, in, you know, he was in a few movies until so he figured out, the, you know, that that really wasn't for him. They had a very interesting relationship. Yeah. They each borrowed things from the other. But it was a very complicated relationship. The only thing I can say is, 
uh, Ford mistreated anyone who loved him. <laughs> that was part of the deal. Yeah. He was an alcoholic all his life. You know, there's, there are patterns there, are things going on. But these people kept coming back and kept working for him, and the re including Wayne. And the reason is because of their sense of loyalty, but also because when they were working on a John Ford movie, they knew they were working on something special. And they knew they were being pushed. And Wayne, and this is why Wayne keeps coming back, even when he's had enough. And when he could go, he had and Yeah, he writes his own. his own ticket. Wayne's the famous guy, not right. Ford right. at that yeah. point. Ford's, Ford's in the twilight of his career. Wayne is the number one box office attraction in America. Yet when John Ford picks up the phone and it's to tell Wayne, I need you at the Christmas pageant, or I need you to star in The Searchers, Wayne reports for duty all the way through, right to the end. Yeah. Anyway, thank you so thank much. You. I'm going to sign books, hang out. Well, there's a, there's a lot more in the book. It's a great read. It's for sale at the front. Buy it, and Glenn will sign it. Thanks again for coming.